Coming up on West Side Stories, a look at medical marijuana use in the state of Michigan. Also, a new way to pay off a parking ticket with food instead of cash. Also, we go behind the scenes right here at WGBU Studios for a nationwide talent search. All that and more next on West Side Stories. West Side Stories is produced by students from the Multimedia Journalism Program at Grand Valley State University. Support also comes from the School of Communications. Inspiring thought, perfecting practice. Welcome to West Side Stories, I'm Reagan Blissett. And I'm Kelly Hubbard. And this fall, it looks like you'll be deciding whether or not Michigan residents will be legalizing recreational marijuana. The ballot initiative for recreational use of marijuana has enough signatures to go on the November 2018 ballot. Reporter Sam Shepperman takes a look at what we've learned about the use of medical marijuana in our state and what things might look like if marijuana use becomes legal for all residents. I was an advocate for medical marijuana. I have been for years. Dr. Crocker is the current owner of the Michigan Holistic Health. This is a place where patients with health issues can seek out help to get their medical marijuana card. Before opening this clinic, Dr. Crocker has seen the use of marijuana in his patients before, but in ways that may not have been as easily accessible or illegal. Among my uh, critically ill patients, a lot of them were using marijuana illegally and getting a lot of good benefits from it. And the main downside was that they had the anxiety associated with doing something illegal. And that was a big risk for patients seeking relief. Jevin Weinberg, a member of the Kalamazoo area, was one of those seeking relief. Well, I had cancer diagnosis at the age of 33 um, that called for a treatment plan of heavy regimen of chemotherapy for, a, for about five months on end. Like While undergoing chemotherapy, Weinberg describes the effects of the therapy as lasting symptoms, like nausea, which he began to self-medicate with marijuana. As I was going through that process, I started to medicate with cannabis because of people that were telling me, hey, you know, cannabis is going to help you with nausea, this and that. And I only had access to, hey, I'm going to call an old high school friend and see if he still has some cannabis that I heard about that he had 10 years ago. You know, it's not right. You're treated like a second class citizen. As of 2008, the use of medical marijuana was passed in the state of Michigan. If patients wish to see if they qualify for their medical card, they must go to a licensed medical doctor. We do the medical, uh, the state required medical evaluation. Uh, we make recommendations to the state as to whether or not we think the patient is, is meets the criteria for the program. Dr. Cracker says he starts by looking at a patient's medical records. Then he has the patient come in for a physical exam. If a patient qualifies for a medical card from the state, they start the paperwork, which usually takes three to four weeks to hear back from the state. Once a patient receives their medical card, they have three options to medicate. Michigan law lets patients grow their own marijuana plants or designate someone over 21 to grow plants for them. But most patients with a medical card buy their medical marijuana at a local dispensary. It's cookie dough that's medicated and you just take a spoon and, and uh, you know take a scoop out of there. Cookie dough is one of the edible options patients can choose at dispensaries like Lake Effect. There are skin rubs that absorb the medication through your skin, and of course, you can even smoke it. Who's our team? Okay. What's our team? The ballot proposal for legalization of recreational marijuana has its opponents. Organizations like the Healthy and Productive Michigan are against the legalization of recreational marijuana. They are opposed to any increase in marijuana use beyond the current medical use. Both Crocker and Weinberg admit there are some negative side effects of marijuana use. Um, certainly marijuana can be abused, just like just about anything can. And if you overuse marijuana, you certainly can suffer some of the consequences as far as jobs and family relationships and things like that. If the worst thing about the medicine is that it's going to make you drowsy or make you want to lay around a little bit, you know, that's a lot better than can be said for most any other forms of medication I can think of, including forms of things that are legal like alcohol and tobacco. I think when it's used properly, um, that the, the benefits far outweigh the risks and the negatives. Uh, no one's ever died from a marijuana overdose, despite the fact that it's been used unregulated for decades. 
With so many different forms of marijuana, both for medical use and recreational use, Weinberg believes that the only way for people to understand the effects of marijuana is to become educated on it. The um, education around medical cannabis is very important uh, for our society as a whole. Uh, the state has laws on the books now that license for it, uh, the commercial aspect of it, and it's going to be a very large commercial aspect. The commercial aspect could be a really big deal for Michigan if marijuana is legalized for recreational use. Communities would receive 35% of taxes towards school aid, 35% towards road repairs, and 30% into the local community. In Kalamazoo, I'm Sam Schreffman. If the ballot proposal passes, then Michigan residents 21 and older can possess up to two and a half ounces of marijuana and grow up to 12 plants in their home. The petition signatures still need to be officially examined before the proposal can be placed on the November ballot. If you've ever received a parking ticket at Grand Valley State University, then you know it can cost up to $35. But as Jessica Kroll reports, there's a new way to pay that ticket and one that may cost you less and at the same time mean more for those in need. An orange envelope no one wants to see on their windshield. Parking citations are not uncommon at Grand Valley State University. Many students hope that they can get away with parking without a permit or in a different lot than their permit allows. Doing so might come at a cost. You're cheating someone out of their parking spot they paid for, so... <laughs> I do feel bad, but it's my job and you're in the wrong. These citations can cost from $25 to $100. If you have gone through the process and you've purchased a permit and you just parked in the wrong spot on accident, it's a $25 fine. Whereas if you did not purchase a permit, because we are a permit-only campus, um, and you take up the spot of someone who did pay for a permit, then the site Citation fine goes up to $35. Students, staff, and even guests who receive a parking citation at GVSU are in luck, though. Through a new program called Food for Fines, up to two citations can be paid off by donating food and other essential items to GVSU's food pantry, Replenish. I paid off all of it. I paid off like the $35 citation with about like like $12, $13 worth of stuff. I think it's a great idea, honestly. It turns something that like is an annoyance and is something that like sucks to something that you're actually like helping other people out with. Caton was inspired by a similar program in Kentucky and created Food for Fines as her independent study during her undergrad at GBSU. Food for Fines had its trial run in the fall of 2017 and took place again in the winter of 2018 until March 2nd. All items went to Replenish, located in room 074 in Kirkhoff. Replenish is the on-campus food resource for our college students. All of our students at GVSU have access to Replenish. It is a service for any student that identifies as food insecure. They benefit because we know that there is a correlation between um, a student having access to nutritious and good foods being directly related to um, their educational outcomes. Items donated to the program fall into different tiers which then correlate to a set dollar amount toward the citation. We have specific foods and our goal is to promote the donation of healthy food items and so each tier is set up based on um, volume as well as cost um, that you would buy from the store for these items. Over 700 items have been donated through Food for Fines since the program started in the fall of 2017. Replenish Food Pantry is available to any GVSU student with food insecurity. I knew that this was a way not only to give people who have received parking citations the opportunity to um, give back to their community um, and pay less in food for the citation fine, but also to um, publicize the resources that we have on campus for students facing food insecurities. For West Side Stories in Allendale, I'm Jessica Kroll. The Food for Fines program ended March 2nd, but Caton says she hopes the program will be offered again at GVSU. She also encourages donations to replenish with or without a parking ticket. Video games are a staple of daily entertainment, especially for young people. But fierce competition in the video game industry has developers looking for ways to increase sales and profits. Reporter Coy Wynn takes a look at the financial struggle between companies and their consumers. 
Video game developers are passionate about making good video games for us to play, but for them to keep doing so, they have to make money. So that's their constraint. They want to make money, they want to monetize the business model. Marketing professor Vivek Dalila explains that because of higher consumer expectation to meet these demands, video game companies need a new way to make money. Especially because developing video games has become a very expensive activity over time. Customers expect more, video games are becoming richer and richer and richer, you know, it, it takes more resources and competition is fierce. Recently, the video game community has expressed frustration about how companies are charging players for more content. You have to spend $60 on the game originally and then eventually they'll release more content after another pay of like $20, which is basically just more content and that basically limits the things that the original gamers, like the original people that play that game can do. Kevin Dye says he's frustrated by how game developers are attempting to charge him for more money for a game he's already bought. Not only that, video game companies are also charging people for fake in-game currency. For example, Fortnite has an in-game currency called V-Bucks and the more someone spends, the more credit they get back and players use this credit to get in-game items like these, which are basically cosmetic items that don't serve much of a benefit, but just make you look better in the game. And then you can buy these costumes or these emotes but literally these are really expensive because like for one thing such as like a hat or a costume that's 1200 v bucks which translates to about $12 in real life while there are people willing to spend money on cosmetic items in games the real concern that has many politicians and parents worried are loot boxes being related to gambling with loot boxes people have spent money on them and they try to get better things out of it such as CS:GO for example there are loot crates that give you either cents worth of objects or objects that are worth hundreds of dollars. So in a way, it's sort of gambling. While many gamers are used to the idea of making money off loot boxes, parents like Kelly Dang do not like the impression it leaves on her kids. I don't like the idea of my kid gambling in a video game because I think they are young and it's a bad influence for them. With politicians and parents speaking out about how loot boxes could impact their children, gamers are concerned about how loot boxes are impacting their games. That was a problem with one of the games. I think the uh, Star, Star Wars Battlefront or something, you know? They kind of just made it difficult for players to keep moving, you know? It was just... Uh, players thought that they're unnecessarily making it life difficult for us. They're, they're, they're forcing us to pay the money, you know? If you're forcing someone to pay the money and that person happens to be a price conscious customer, that's a problem. <laughs> What Delilah is saying is that because Battlefront 2 allowed players to spend real money for faster advantages in game, players were not happy. However, gamers like Dai are still willing to buy and spend more money on games he feels are worth it. If the game does include that many hours of extra gameplay, it's sort of like buying a whole new game and it's kind of worth it in a sense. While companies are still trying to figure out the sweet spot when it comes to charging players, gamers will still support games they feel are worth their money. Reporting for West Side Stories, I'm Koi Wynn. With Hawaii and Washington state governors pushing to add stricter regulations to loot boxes, video game companies may have to find new ways to add a profit to their bottom line. If you know someone who is a big fan of shows like America's Got Talent, you might want to call them about this next feature. A nationwide talent search stopped right here at WGBU Studios last week. I'd like to take you behind the scenes now and show you some very talented youngsters looking for their first big break. Does this face look a little familiar? Or if you haven't seen him, you may have heard him. Ethan Bortnick is a talented musician who sold the hearts of America when he was just six years old. Bortnick was featured on this night show with Jay Leno and the Oprah Winfrey show. He stood alongside singers like Beyonce and Justin Bieber. Many said he was a prodigy, recognized by the Guinness Book of World Records as the youngest solo musician to headline his own concert tour at nine years old a recital for my teacher um, and someone someone watching recorded it posted it online and it fell into the hands of the producers at the Tonight Show uh, which was with Jay Leno at the time and uh, and so when I was six I did that show and then Oprah saw that and had me on her show and then things took off I did more uh, performances many of Bortnick's performances are about giving 
Sportnik has helped raise over $50 million for nonprofits around the world. His performances also started to gain attention from PBS. At nine years old, he had his first PBS special called The Musical Time Machine with Ethan Bortnick. Then when he was 11 years old, Bortnick and PBS partnered again for the Power of Music special. In 2017, Bortnick and PBS collaborated on their biggest event yet, a nationwide talent search called The Celebration of Music. Then we sort of wanted to do something really special that, um, that I guess uh, public television doesn't really have. And of course, this idea came to mind, and it's been going amazing. You know, we, we just started about six months ago, and it's amazing to see some of these incredibly talented kids do what they're doing, and being able to give this platform and that I was given, you know, five years ago, is amazing. Celebration of Music is a talent search for talented young people across America. The search takes place at local PBS studios for the chance to win a guest spot performing on TV and the chance to appear on stage at one of Bortnick's concerts. Ellie Brower is 10 years old and has been singing for two years. Flying free to those who ground me, take a message back from me. I won, well, I'd certainly be happy, but if I was to win, I think it'd be more a winning for confidence and just uh, a win not to show off about, but more to just enjoy and think I did it and I'm proud of myself for that. Another young contestant is nine-year-old Sage Brumba. Sage is an opera singer who realized she could sing opera after watching YouTube videos. That's a hard question to ask. I want to do this because it's just, I, it's just another fun opportunity, and it, my dream is to be an opera singer. I want her to um, be able to get exposure and just be in front of the camera and just be comfortable being in front of people and singing. I saw him years ago, I think it was on Oprah, and it's kind of neat that like now years later, you know, Sage is here and she's going to be able to meet him and she's really excited. The talent search in Grand Rapids went on for two days with over 20 contestants. The two shows will air on April 15th and 22nd, all competing for a chance to perform live on stage. Stage so, with Bortnick um, at his Grand Rapids concert on May 3rd. Once again, it, it is amazing to see all of these kids do what they're doing. Um, truthfully, I have no clue how there are so many talented people in this country. It's truth, it, it's amazing to see. It. It's like the tip of the iceberg of all of the amazing talented kids that there are. And we're able to do this and, and see all of this. So I'm, again, to do this, of course, with, with WGVU and, and all of these stations is amazing. To vote for the contestant you want to see perform on stage with Bortnick, tune in to WGVU on April 15th and 22nd. In Grand Rapids, I'm Reagan Blissett. So Reagan, what was it like meeting Ethan? Ethan was so great. He's so very humble and he's just such an accomplished young man for only being 17 years old and being able to give this platform to other youngsters like how he had is just great. Well, I'm so glad he could be here in this studio. West Michigan has experienced its fair share of sporting success over the years. This year, a local favorite is celebrating an important anniversary. Jake O'Donnell is in Comstock Park with the West Michigan Whitecaps. This isn't just any old season for the ball club. 2018 marks the 25th anniversary of the Whitecaps organization. Throughout the years, the team has experienced many milestones, including winning six Midwest League championships and setting the Class A single season attendance record. However, the ball club's most defining moment came not on the diamond or even during the season, but on a cold winter's day in 2014. On January 3, 2014, a fire broke out at Fifth Third Ballpark, destroying one-third of the stadium in a matter of hours. It was a sad day for all those in the Whitecaps organization. However, West Michigan was determined to play baseball 
and by opening day, the park was ready to seat spectators once again. The fire was one of the most defining moments. The whole community rallied around us, and we were grateful to have the community um, be with us during that time. And when we had all this adversity, they rallied around us and were there for us through everything. The all-star games that we've hosted, the championships that we've had, everything that's ever happened here at Fifth Third Ballpark has really defined us. Since the beginning, fans have been one of the biggest reasons for the Whitecaps' success. Throughout the fire and onward into the 25th anniversary season, the loyalty of West Michigan has been unwavering. So I uh, found out about the Whitecaps when I read an article on clickondetroit.com. It was about a uh, fire at the home of the West Michigan Whitecaps. Looking at it now, going to games, it doesn't even look like a fire happened. 25 years is a huge accomplishment for an organization like that. And hopefully they can bring home the championship this year. And I'll definitely expect something big, big event that they can put on for the fans and everybody that comes out to enjoy the games. This season, honoring the fans is the top priority for the Whitecaps, and the team is pulling out all the stops. We are throwing it back to 1994 on a lot of games. We, we are giving away a 1994 uh, Chevrolet Corvette this year. We have uh, six championship rings that we're going to give away throughout the season, and we're really going to try and embrace the 25th season milestone. With so much to celebrate this season, the Whitecaps are doing everything they can to provide their fans with not just a good baseball game, but an all-around entertainment experience. We're always looking to find a way to make things new and exciting. We have Princess Night, we have Paw Patrol Night, we also have $2 beers, those are on our Thursdays. We have Human Cannonball coming back, we have Daniel Davis coming back, and on top of that, we have baseball. We have so many things that have worked so well for us in the past 25 years that we're going to continue to do, and so many things that we're excited to show our fans this year as well. Over the past couple decades, one of the things the Whitecaps have prided themselves on is their food, specifically the infamous Fifth Third Burger. This year is no exception as the team plans to roll out a new crazy culinary creation. So the fan food vote will release the top 10 on February 27th, uh, and our fans get to vote on which food item they want to see here at Fifth Third Ballpark. Can't release those names yet, but there are some interesting concepts. And there's always been interesting concepts, but this year it, it, it's going to be a lot different. Last year and the year before, I think we focused mostly on the taste. This year, there's some taste elements, but there's also a lot of weirdness elements there. As far as the team itself goes, the rosters are announced at the end of Detroit Tigers spring training. However, after coming off a successful regular season in 2017, the future looks bright under new manager Lance Parrish. Obviously, uh, we were fortunate last year to have some prospects given to us, uh, Isaac Paredes and uh, Daz Cameron, who played four games here. So you never know what's going to happen during the season. We're going to have a lot of good talent here at Fifth Third Ballpark. Whether you're a diehard baseball fan, a college student looking to have a fun night out with friends, or if you just want to have a great fan family outing. The Whitecaps invite you to help them celebrate a quarter century of America's pastime in West Michigan. So 25th season, our slogan is every season has a story. We want you to spend your summer at Fifth Third Ballpark because we want you to make the memories that you're going to truly cherish. It may be empty now, but with such an important milestone on deck, Fifth Third Ballpark is sure to be jam-packed when the Whitecaps open their 25th season come April 5th. Reporting from Comstock Park, I'm Jake O'Donnell. Thanks, Jake. If you want to get in on the action, tickets are available at the box office or at whitecapsbaseball.com. Now it's time for our weekly story from WGBU Digital Studios. Check it out. Holidays are here and at Grand Armory Brewing in Grand Haven. There's a new beer on tap and it is of the seasonal variety 
Ben, tell us all about this holiday delight. All right, today we are pouring the white chocolate blonde. This is uh, one of our mainstay beers, our beech tree blonde, with white chocolate added during fermentation. So what that gives you is a light, crisp, refreshing blonde ale with just a nice residual sweetness on the back end, perfect for the holidays or year round. Wow, uh, you want to talk about a crystal clear beer. What are you guys doing? This, usually there's a little haze, right? But so not, not th this, this is an unfiltered beer. This is actually just done through cold crashing and uh, meticulous technique. And how did you come up with this beer? You're saying that mm, so, maybe this was unintentional? Yeah, this was a happy little accident, as Bob Ross says. This was, a, this was our classic blonde ale, and we just said, what would happen if we uh, added white chocolate? And the answer seemed to be everybody would love it. All right, well, let's take a taste. You already know what this tastes like. I. Oh, what a great aroma. All right. That's a very happy mistake. That is that is fantastic. And just in time for the holidays? Just in time for the holidays. Not just here though, right? Not just here, no. Come late December, we will be launching this beer in uh, 12 ounce six packs. You can find it at all your favorite bottle shops throughout Michigan. All right, perfect for the holidays, perfect for sharing. Happy holidays to Happy you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays to you on the draft. Cheers. Cheers. A special thanks to WGVU Digital Studios for that story. Well, I'm afraid that that's all the time that we have for this week. I'm Kelly Hubbard. And I'm Reagan Blissett. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you again next week. West Side Stories is produced by students from the Multimedia Journalism Program at Grand Valley State University. Support also comes from the School of Communications, inspiring thought, perfecting practice.